I sort of came to green building from, a, uh, from electric vehicles, actually. So I uh, started a conversion of a Japanese mini truck and through that became involved in CESA uh, with some of the electric car shows that they had there. And through that sort of really got more connections in the solar industry. And that just sort of, sort of grew my passion and, and uh, interest for green building. So yeah, I, I would consider myself a lifelong maker. I've been uh, building stuff since I was probably 12 years old. So I've done a Japanese mini truck electric conversion. I built a solar boat before. And then most recently, I did the retrofit on our house. So one of the big challenges uh, for the 2030 building code, the proposed max U value is 0.8 uh, watts per meter squared Kelvin. So that is essentially a passive house window, and that is proposed as code minimum for 2030 for all buildings. So right now we can hit uh, pretty decent values with uh, triple OE coatings. Uh, we get down to the 0.65 U value range. Which is, which is pretty decent, but uh, when you're doing three low E coatings on a triple glazed window, there are limitations. You can't hit both uh, 0.65 and a really good solar heat gain coefficient. So as uh, Stuart was talking, we need to get the solar heat into these buildings to get this uh, energy down, and you can't do that with a standard triple pane window with three low E coatings. You need to have a sort of a sun stop type coating to block most of the solar heat so you don't build up heat inside the sealed unit and cause the sealed unit to fail over time. So there's definitely some challenges if you're just gonna stand, stick with standard uh, low E triple, triple pane windows. So quad pane is an option, but stuff gets really heavy really fast. Everybody wants bigger windows all the time. We already run into problems with uh, people want too big windows and the sealed units end up weighing 300 pounds and we can't even carry them anymore. So. So for sure, for us, uh, simulation is a good thing, but we also want to test what we're building. So uh, we've recently built a full-scale thermal test chamber, which allows us to test uh, full-size windows and up to six, o six, eight double doors. So we can put a uh, product in here, you can see it in the picture there, and we can take that chamber down to about minus 35. And that really is allowing us to look at the sort of the qualitative aspects of how your windows and doors perform um, you know, how do you have condensation buildup, frost buildup, uh, what's the comfort like when you're standing next to it? So th this is really, we just sort of got this going uh, early this summer and it's really allowing us to really dial in on the overall product quality. So one of the neat things we've been working on is vacuum glazing. So uh, a VIG or a, a vacuum insulated glazing, you've got two sheets of four millimeter tempered glass they are held about 0.4 millimeters apart. And the ones we're using, they use a soft metallic seal around the edge to seal the two panes together and hold the, uh, keep the air out. And then there's 0.4 millimeter pillars that are in between the two panes to keep them from touching. When you've got vacuum inside, in between these two panes of glass, obviously you have air pressure pushing on the outside, which is about 14, 15 PSI. So if you've got you know, a four foot by four foot window, you've got thousands of pounds pushing those two panes of glass together. So they actually have little pillars in between spaced about every 60 millimeters, and that keeps those two panes apart. Obviously a VIG has a huge advantage in terms of a thermal. Uh, just a VIG by itself, the ones we're using, depending on the low E coating you pick, we can get down to about a 0.48 center glass U value, and that's just the VIG by itself. Uh, the neat thing with a VIG, is there's no limitations on the low E coatings. You can put two low E coatings back to back. Because there's no air in between, there's no heat to build up. Uh, you don't have the, the pumping action that you get in a standard sealed unit with uh, air expanding and contracting from day to night. So your sealed units should last a very long time. Uh, downsize, obviously, cost. Right now, these are very expensive. Uh, around $30 a square foot cost kind of thing. So. These are not cheap, um, but the goal is to you know, make sure that these can actually perform in our climate. Somebody's got to start manufacturing them locally, and then we can hopefully start using them for high-performance buildings. So obviously, uh, availability right now, it's very difficult to get a hold of these. Uh, Duxton, I see they're showing that we can get a few of them. Um, how, you know, how feasible they are, how much they cost, I'm not, in, I'm not entirely sure, but it's not exactly, it's just sort of your everyday builder product right now. Uh, obviously you do see those pillars. Uh, 
once your window's a little bit dirty like they tend to get, you probably don't notice it. So, The other thing is when you get really high performance windows, they build up dew on the exterior because the exterior pane is so cold every morning the window has dew on it because you're not losing heat through the window like a traditional window which keeps that dew evaporated off so uh, even you'll see that even with just sort of standard uh, low E coatings and, and really high performance triple panes people will complain about uh, not being able to see out of the windows for a couple hours every morning because they're covered in dew so we don't just do work uh, at All Weather, we do some fun stuff as well, and one of the neat projects we did was using reclaimed materials, actually, which kind of has a tie-in later. So this uh, is actually a boat we built for the Sourdough River Raft Festival in Edmonton, and we built the hulls for it using door cutouts, which is a waste product that we are left over with from uh, manufacturing doors. Whenever we cut a window into a door, we're left with a piece of foam and uh, it happens to make a great boat hull. So we actually made it solar powered too. So this is the SS All Weathering. It's got a thousand watts of solar. And we, yeah, we took it to the Sourdough River Raft Festival f four years, I think, three years. We, we got best first time entry, most innovative raft. We won first place overall in our third year. So it was a lot of fun. It's a good way to have some fun with our team. And it kind of shows that, you know, we can do the same thing as, uh, you know, have, have as much fun with you know a recycled product and uh, completely solar powered and it's worked really well we actually use it for team events we had it at Wabam and just uh, a couple weeks ago so that's enough about work so our house how we started so it's a 1953 semi bungalow so story and a half we're in North Glenora um, not too far away we bought it in 2010 and we did uh, a first round eco energy audit and we did some foundation insulation, we insulated the headers, uh, we did the weeping tile, sewer line, we put some more insulation in the walls in the furnace room. Uh, so we did a few sort of minor air, air details, did some air sealing, and got us from a 63 to a 67 enter guide rating, which was the old, the old system. But the, the good thing about this house is it had a solid foundation, and we had put this basic you know, work into it with the uh, the waterproofing, the sewer line, it had a really good site as well. We've got a perfect site for solar. There's uh, no shading whatsoever. So we say, okay, this house has got, you know, it's a great neighborhood, it's a great site, it's got some good bones. We think it's got some good potential. You can see the back of it there. I mean, generally, not too bad a shape. The inside was pretty solid. The previous owner had done a nice job renovating, so it was, it was a good, good bones to build off of. And we really, like, like I say, we really liked the area. We didn't want to tear it down. And, this is the upstairs as it was. You can see the sloped ceilings. It had uh, R7 fiberglass, if you're lucky, in the sloped ceiling portions. We would get frost build up in the corners, uh, behind the bookshelves, behind the kids' bed, so we'd always have to pull the furniture away from the walls. You know, it's, it looks nice and it was kind of cute and quaint, but when it's minus 30 outside, it's uh, definitely not the best performance. So obviously for us, I mean, the uh, shingles on it were at least 15 years old. They're starting to peel and curl, so we're saying, okay, we're probably gonna have to replace the roof pretty soon. So we said, okay, well, we don't wanna replace the roof without adding some more insulation. And we're saying, okay, maybe we should add some dormers upstairs. Maybe we could improve the upstairs, make it a little bit more livable. So it's kinda at this point, we started talking with Dave and Peter, and I probably talked to Stuart in there at some point as well. And, and we're saying, hey, what do you guys think of this? You know, this idea, we could add some dormers in here and increase the size of the upstairs. And Peter mentioned that, you know, by the time you add all these dormers, you're not gonna have any original roof left. So why don't you just cut the whole top off and start fresh with a new second story? And we thought, oh my God, that's crazy. That's, that would be, <laughs> that would be really scary. But uh, we realized more and more that that would really give us what we wanted in terms of the finished product. So we started doing some SketchUp modeling. Uh, Peter got me started on the uh, Hot 2000 modeling. We did some initial modeling. I think he used it as a base case for one of his presentations at one point. And we came up with a plan. So for a full second story addition, we were gonna cut off the roof. We, we wanted to add a veranda. We really liked the look of that. Um, we we're gonna add three bedrooms plus an office upstairs, upstairs laundry. Our sort of goal was to kinda, you know, we're gonna be putting new siding on this. We, we put a new roof. Let's get some energy efficient construction. Uh, potential, maybe we'll put some solar panels on the roof at some point. And the stretch goal, we really wanted to have a roof deck because we thought it'd be kind of cool. So 
So we started doing some planning and drawings with Butterwick and they helped us out getting through all the permits and getting our plan made up and sort of process kind of continually evolved through, throughout. So we started kind of tossing around ideas for insulation. So, you know, how much insulation are we going to put on? How far are we going to go in the energy efficiency? So what we came up with is what I've used before at work is door cutouts. So a single door cutout has about an R10 to R12 insulation rating. So, and it's 1.75 inches thick. So three layers will be at least R30 and is about uh, five and a quarter inches thick overall, which is sort of feasible in terms of additional insulation. Uh, they come in steel and fiberglass skin. Um, we decided to go with fiberglass because you can just cut them directly and screw them to the house and they're good to go. It creates a nice durable surface. It's nice and, you know, it's nice and clean and relatively solid. So like I say, we, we decided to go with three layers, R30 overall. Um, the range in our value, they are made with a blowing agent. It's a polyurethane foam and they start out about R12 and they will eventually age out to about R10. So uh, for all the energy modeling, I used an R10 value. So likely it's a little bit higher right now, but it'll eventually be R10, so that, uh, that works out okay. The, once we sort of realized like, okay, I can get this material for a very low cost because it's from work, it's basically a waste product. How, you know, what's the, what does that allow further? So we realized that, okay, if we get to efficient enough, we can actually elim eliminate natural gas entirely from the site. Uh, then obviously you've got the possibility of adding solar to, you know, at least offset a part of it. And maybe you can even get all the way to net zero. So we started to, you know, really dig into the wall system design. Uh, obviously we wanted to do an exterior insulation for the main floor. We didn't want to tear off the inside drywall. The uh, main floor was in really good shape, so we didn't want to tear that up. So we said, okay, all the insulation's going on the outside. And talking with uh, Peter and Dave and Stuart, we s figured out that, okay, we're probably the best way to go is to do the WRB on the sheeting and with the insulation to the outside of that. So this is sort of a kind of a newer building idea. It seems to work really nice. The idea is you can install your windows to the sheeting have your air barrier sealed right up to your windows and then the insulation all goes to the outside. So you don't have to worry about uh, you know, air sealing on the outside of that. Uh, obviously you want to make sure you've got two thirds of your total R value in your wall past your air barrier and that's to uh, prevent uh, chances of condensation buildup. Obviously with three layers of door cutouts on here that forms its own vapor barrier. So if we had, you know, done traditional construction with a poly vapor barrier on the inside plus the foam on the outside, we we're going to end up with two vapor barrier situation and uh, we want to try and avoid that if possible. From what I've found in sort of my R&D work with windows and just my own research, when you've got air leakage through a building, you've got mass leakage of moisture and that equals condensation. So if you can stop your mass airflow, then you're really going to reduce instances of condensation. And that is going to lead to a more resilient building and a sort of more durable structure overall. So it's not so much that you need a vapor barrier, but you really need to stop the airflow of to moisture transfer through the house. So this kind of was based on uh, some, of the, some of the literature I found was on what was called a remote system. Uh, which was developed by the Cold Climate Housing Research Center, I think, in Alaska. So I figured they probably kind of know what they're doing if, with cold buildings up there. Uh, there's, there's a lot of other people who have been doing similar ideas with the WRB on the sheeting. Um, there's a Canadian system that's very similar. But these guys had uh, some nice documentation and it's kind of helped me solidify all these ideas and uh, come up with some, some good sort of science to say, to back up, the, back up the ideas. I wasn't totally crazy. So windows, obviously I work for all weather windows, so we've got a, I had a few options available to me. Uh, we went with our Apex 9100, which is a V-weld window. That means the mullions in between your two combinations are uh, welded right to the frame, so you don't have a box-to-box -box connection. Uh, this gives you a really good seal. We also use some uh, 2100 low-profile picture windows. This has a really low-profile frame. It's very small which 
uh, gives you really good overall U values because the, the glass is always better U value than the frame, so overall you get a really good value. Uh, just for the base windows, we decided to go tripane, dual OE plus argon, just our standard glass. This gives a center glass U value 0.755. Solar heat gain is pretty good at 0.56. Uh, but what we're also able to get is I got 10 vacuum insulated glazing prototype units that we were able to bring in. And we tried a couple different U-value options that we're evaluating. U-value for center glass is between 0.36 for the one version and 0.44 for another. So we're like almost double the U-value or the R-value of a standard really good triple pane window. So these are seriously high performance. Solar heat gain is a little bit lower, 0.44 to 0.54, depending on the low E coatings you pick. And obviously, we, I did a lot of work to make sure the overhangs were sized correctly to uh, uh, shade the building correctly to avoid that. We did some comparative energy modeling. This was really interesting because basically, we already were at such a level of efficiency, even with the tri-pane windows, that it, it hardly made any difference, which is kind of disappointing. <laughs> You can see the green is your net gain of your windows. In, in every case, with all the three types I modeled, they all, all the windows were always a net gain in energy for the building. So we were gaining more energy for the building than losing. So in, this was a, a case where it worked out really good. We got a good site, good shading in the summer, and we were always gaining uh, in terms of overall. But there was really actually very little difference between the VIGs in overall building use and the standard tripane because the VIGs also came with a slightly lower solar heat gain coefficient, so you gain slightly less energy. So it's, it's definitely really good learning. Basically what you have to do, you have to do your individual house and you really got to do a thorough job of all the shading and all the details of it. Every house is going to be different. Solar heat gain and everything changes drastically how those windows perform and how if they're going to be a net energy generator or a net energy loss. There's obviously a lot more to heating uh, to a house design than, you know, megajoules of energy. So you got to look at sound, comfort, overheating, etc. Uh, VIGs are really good for sound. They've got a STC rating of about 40. So they're very quiet, a lot more quiet than triple panes. Mechanical system, we really wanted to go very quick, uh, very, uh, I need to go quick because I got two minutes left. <laughs> we, uh, we wanted to go simple because I've seen some net zero houses where they've got, uh, it looks like a submarine control room. We didn't want that. Uh, obviously we did some uh, weighing with heat pumps versus more solar. Uh, Peter has a nice spreadsheet for that. So we figured out our energy modeling was about 15,000 kilowatt hours total, 5,000 for heat, 5,000 for hot water and 5,000 for uh, just interior usage. And that was based on just straight electric. And by going to heat pumps, we were able to really reduce that down to about 10,000 total. And that really reduces the amount of solar we needed if we wanted to hit net zero. So this is the, this is the design we came up with. Uh, we modeled it all up in SketchUp and uh, did the plans off of that. So you can see we did decide to go for the roof deck. We got the stairs going up above the existing stairs, uh, main floor laundry. And here's where we uh, started. So we started tearing stuff apart, tearing the inside out. It's always interesting to see what the bones of your 60 plus year old house look like. Started tearing the roof off. We started uh, demolition at the end of August 2018. So it uh, was a little bit scary because we were thinking, okay, we're getting kind of close to winter here. Uh, they started building the roof sections on the front lawn, which worked out pretty nice, and got them craned up. We got a tall wall section in the middle for that uh, high peak. That's 15 feet high. We did uh, big ply lamb beams, 16 inches by 5 inches, running all the way across front to back. So that middle section and the roof deck is completely supported by those. So we got no supporting walls inside on the upstairs, which that really made the engineering easier because we didn't have to run supports down through the middle of the house. Obviously, we actually lived through the house the whole time. So what we did is we built a poly wall and a separate doorway in between uh, completely blocking off one front bedroom and the full upstairs in the front door. So uh, workers got to go in through the front. I almost forgot to mention, we obviously chose to go with Dave uh, Butterwick Construction to, uh, to do, do the build for us. So they went in through the front. We lived in the main floor and uh, all moved down into the basement. 
We did, went with uh, Delta Vent self-adhesive because we were trying to bridge the, you know, we took it right down to the sheeting, the original like uh, one by 10 boards, whatever boards were on the main floor. We wanted to make sure that was sealed up nice. So we chose a self-adhesive uh, WRB and that uh, just transitioned up to the uh, newly built walls upstairs. And thankfully, Dave got the, uh, most of the windows in in time for most of the snow. So, But most of it melted after that, so we were still okay. We uh, got the foundation under the veranda insulated, dug and insulated right away. Those are some of the door cutouts we're using right there. Uh, we did a full wraparound eave to give us proper shading on the main floor as well. And you can see, you can kind of see we did a layer of door cutouts underneath the eaves as well as underneath the... Uh, a ledger for the veranda to give us a thermal bre break between uh, the exterior framing and the interior uh, framing. So you can see we're starting to put the main door cutouts on. We've got three layers. These are the stacks of cutouts. We actually ended up even using some of the embossed ones, so some of the, the funny sort of extra shapes. I tried to get all standard sizes and standard shapes, so we always ended up with a few uh, of the funny sizes, but we would put those on the middle layers and they still work pretty good. Maybe I lost a couple percents on that, but uh, I'm not too worried. We used an aluminum uh, nosing to extend the window out uh, to get us to our full five and a quarter extra wall thickness. Uh, that was a prototype part. We put it on on site, which was interesting. So we didn't just use standard flashing. Uh, it probably would have been easier to do it, but uh, overall the finished product worked, worked out pretty nice. Because I'm in r and I got access to a thermal camera, so I got to play around with that a little bit. I think it was minus 18 when I took these. They had one little layer on the top peak there, and already it, with one layer, that temperature of the panels was about minus 14. So already one layer is making a huge difference in terms of your heat loss. We hadn't done the foundation around the back and side, so this gave us a really neat opportunity to kind of see, okay, this is how much heat loss you've got through your foundation when you don't have proper foundation insulation. So you can see it's a huge difference. That, uh, the three layers was right down at minus 18, and the foundation was about minus three, and that's going all the way down, all the way around the house. Uh, obviously, we did a rain screen system with this much insulation, so we got long uh, nine-inch screws right through into the framing of the original house. Uh, we started getting the steel roof on. This is up on the roof deck. We did a Duradeck membrane, and we put the attic hatches in the, off the roof deck to make sure we don't have any uh, really reduce as much as possible the uh, openings through the vapor barrier to reduce chances of air leakage. We did uh, R14 rock saw in the upstairs. You can also see Dave did uh, strapping on the ceilings to, so we can run all the wires there to make sure that uh, there's as few penetrations as possible into the roof, into the roof uh, vapor barrier. Uh, we did all our ducting. Here, once it thawed out, we dug around the foundation and put the another three layers of the door cutouts down. Uh, the height of one door cutout was about 64 inches total from there. So, and we had previously had the foundation dug around, waterproofed, and uh, the guys who did the waterproofing put a two-inch styrofoam drainage board all the way down to the footer. So we had about, you know, R7 all the way down to the footer, and we've got R30 from probably three feet below the grade level all the way up. Started getting into finishings. We did a cedar decking on the veranda, some pine tongue groove on the ceiling. Went with the hardy board siding. This was the exciting part. We got some solar up there. So we worked with Dandelion Renewables. They were able to come up with a nice system that bridged the roof deck across there. You can kind of, yeah, you can see it here. So we, the roof deck extends right to the edge of the house at the back. And we wanted the solar to bridge across to sort of tie in the roof deck and, and give it a nice sort of finished edge. You have to have your roof deck two meters back from the edge of the building now by code, so you can't uh, just have the railing right up to the edge. Furnace room, so not a furnace anymore. So there's our, we worked with Air Aid Mechanical. They got us uh, set up with the Fujitsu air source heat pump, uh, J2, and we did the uh, A.O. Smith hot water tank. Those are the two solar inverters, a uh, five and a 3.8 kilowatt. We got a 12.24 kilowatt total and you can see the drain water heat recovery as well. And we did a Vani 2400 gold uh, HRV. And here it is pretty much today. We got the railing on. We haven't done the deck skirting yet, so we still got to do a bit of, uh, bit of work to go. Here's the roof deck as of today. Here's the inside, we got it all painted up. We are actually moved up now, and it's, uh, it's awesome. It's super quiet, 
and very comfortable so far. Solar, we've got some, of course I just have a solar array first time so I have to brag about that. It's lots of fun tracking that. Uh, we exported 1600 kilowatt hours in July which was pretty awesome. Got my first negative electricity bill. Next steps, we've got to finish up landscaping, a few more details, do some optimization. I'd like to do an as-built hot 2000 model and then kind of compare that to uh, how, how this is going to go. And obviously we just kind of got to monitor performance and see how close we are to the actual net zero target. Recommendations, I would probably start in spring if I was going to do this again. It was a little bit freaky doing it through the winter. Uh, if you can dig around your foundation waterproof insulate in one step, that's a big advantage. We did this twice because we did it five years before we started the reno and got it all insulate, uh, got it all waterproofed and then had to do it again to insulate the foundation properly. So like Peter says, do it right the first time. Talk energy advisor was great. Once you get your house relatively airtight, you can do depressurization. We used a uh, bouncy castle fan and that actually worked not too bad. So. Uh, door cutouts in general was a fun product to use. It was really neat to use because uh, it's completely reclaimed. Didn't cost us very much. Obviously had more labor to use it because the panels are small. From my experience using it, I would say these are really good if you want to insulate your foundation. Um, we used it in the heels of the trusses so we didn't have to go to such a high truss uh, to give us a bit better R value there. And it's really good for floor insulation. We glued them right down to the uh, basement floor in the furnace room, just glued it right down, put three quarter inch plywood right over top. Don't have to do any framing. They're so sturdy and, and structural on their own, they're, they're good to go. So I don't know if I'd recommend using them for your entire house. We can't, we, I, I used about six months of production from all weather windows to do our house. We used 24 pallets of door cutouts. So obviously this isn't a long-term solution for everybody, but it is a product out there that's available for some of these more sort of specific um, options. And all that's left for us to do is sit back and enjoy the roof deck. So thanks, guys.